Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait a few minutes to let people come into the webinar before we begin. If you would like, drop in the chat where you're coming from. We'd love to hear. Welcome everyone to Jane Austen and Company. My name is Anne Ferdig and I'm a doctoral candidate in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as well as the co-director of Jane Austen and Company. We are delighted tonight, not only to see you all here for the third event in our series, Asia and the Regency, but also to celebrate a very special day indeed. All of us here at Jane Austen and Company would like to wish a very happy birthday to our beloved novelist, Jane Austen. Today, Jane Austen turns 246. She was born on December 16th, 1775. I understand for some of the people in the audience it's already the 17th, so it will be a belated birthday. But nonetheless, we are delighted tonight in honor of her birthday to welcome Dr. Peter Saber to talk about the, uh, from Zoho to My Lai, Horace Walpole and China. For those of you joining us for the first time tonight, Jane Austen and Company is a free public humanities series hosted by the Jane Austen Summer Program. Our mission is to bring free events and workshops on Jane Austen and her broader global context to audiences around the world. Tonight, I am joined by my co-hosts, Dr. Inga Brody, as well as our technical director, Jared Powell, and I'm gonna hand things over now to Inga to talk a little bit more about what we do. Hi everyone, I'm Inga Brody. I teach um, in the same department at uh, UN, UN, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill that Anne and Jared come from as well. And I also teach in the Asian studies and global studies programs there. Um, I co-founded and direct the Jane Austen Summer Program, which is the umbrella organization for Jane Austen and Company. So Jane Austen and Company is one of the outreach um, arms of our, um, our, our larger organization. So, and in case you don't know, the Jane Austen Company began as a library outreach program. It, it was Anne's brainchild and uh, she engaged with, she and other graduate students engaged with one or two dozen participants at a time. But during COVID, Anne and I decided to take the format online um, and began with the series Staying Home at Jane Austen. Um, this was followed by our series Race in the Regency, um, and uh, this, which took interdisciplinary approaches to the experience and representations of race in the Regency, primarily in relation to slavery and abolition. And each of these um, events in these two series attracted hundreds of visitors from around the world. So we we're very grateful um, for this um, online format. We're hoping to lead the way towards creating increasingly international, diverse, and three-dimensional representations of life in the Regency. Um, and not only the Regency, but um, today's, today's uh, program extends a little further back in time. Um, I like to think of these two series together, or all, all three of them as um, a form of unmasking the Regency, um, considering that uh, we are able to unmask COVID-wise as well during these um, 
during these exchanges. And it's uh, our speakers also are unmasking a far more complex position of international cultural exchange and discourses on race in this period. I'm going to turn this over to Kimio, who is here now, I think, and who can introduce uh, Peter for us. Yes, thank you very much, Inga. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Peter Saber. Uh, Peter Saber is Canada Research Chair and Professor of English at McGill University uh, in Montreal where he is also a director of the Bernie Center. Uh, Horace Walpole has long been among his primary interests. He's the author of Horace Walpole, The Critical Heritage, and of many Walpolean essays and articles. His recent publications include Samuel Richardson in Context, co-edited with Betty Schellenberg. Uh, this came out from uh, Cambridge University Press and uh, the Cambridge Companion to Emma, uh, also from Cambridge University Press, uh, which came out in 2015. He is general editor of the court journals and letters of Francis Burney, and uh, additional journals and letters of Francis Burney, uh, which came out in uh, between 2015 and 18. He's also general editor of the letters of Dr. Charles Burney, uh, which began in 1991. Um, this will be completed in six volumes. Uh, he's principal investigator for Reading with Austin, a digital recreation of the library used by Jane Austen at Godmersham Park. And you can actually find this on uh, the website if you like. Um, so um, actually, I met uh, in person Peter uh, Saber, first of all, in Japan uh, many years ago when he visited our university, Sofia University, and he gave a wonderful lecture <laughs> about actually about the portrait and the picture uh, and the miniature. And it was, just marvelous and our students loved it and uh, also uh, Peter invited me over to McGill uh, several years back and um, that was that was such a nice visit too so so we already have this kind of interchange between Asia and the West and so I, I'm so pleased to invite Peter over to this um, uh, seminar series um, thank you so much Peter for joining us today and now, uh, before we hear from Peter, uh, we need a few words of instruction from our technical director, Jared Powell. Yes, thank you, Kimio. So let me share my screen here. Okay, so I'd like to take a moment to explain how tonight's event will work. It will last about 90 minutes in total. And so throughout and after Peter's presentation, you're welcome to put questions in the Q and A box on Zoom, and you know, at the end of the at the end of the presentation, we'll have the Q and A where Inga, Kimio, and Anne will ask those questions to Peter. And if you would like to chat to other attendees, you can use the chat box, as you as many of you have already been doing, to let us know where you're zooming from. So, questions for Peter go in the Q and A, which you know it's right there on the little strip. <laughs> questions to the audience or comments to the audience as a whole, go to the chat. And on that end, we, or on that note, we usually enjoy a robust chat in our events and some people wish to hide it. They can find it a bit distracting. And so if you wish to hide the chat, I've got this little slide show here with some instructions. If you're on a Windows PC, you click the chat icon there and it should pop up in its own separate window. And you just click and hold and drag it off screen as there. If you are on Mac, it works very similarly. There's just an extra step. Instead of coming out in its own window, it initially comes out on the side and you have to do this little drop down and make it pop out. And then it's on its own, drag it off screen. And finally, if you're on mobile, again, sort of a similar process. You start by clicking chat and then your bell icon and then to mute, you click there. And if you have issues trying to mute the chat, just you know, put it in the chat and I'll, I'll monitor it for the first few minutes and help you out individually. 
And with that, I believe we're back to Anne. Thank you, Jared. Please note that tonight's presentation will be recorded. We typically post these on our website about a week or two after the event with the holidays, it might be a little slow. All of our previous events are currently available and this one will be as well. And without further ado, I'd like to hand things off to Dr. Peter Saber. Okay, well, thank you so much for uh, the, to the organizers and uh, especially to Kimio, who uh, invited me first to give this talk and uh, has uh, introduced me so uh, generously as well. Um, I am a bit concerned, though, that I might be here under false pretenses. Uh, I know that the primary mission of Jane Austen and company is to present lectures on women living in the Regency era. Now, Horace Walpole, uh, the youngest son of the great Prime Minister Sir Robert Walpole, was not a woman, and he died in 1797, which is uh, 14 years uh, before the start of the Regency period. He was, he was, though, a friend and supporter of many women writers and artists, uh, most notably uh, the playwrights and novelists uh, Frances Burney and Hannah More, the painter Lady Diana Beauclair, the sculptor Anne Damer, the novelist Mary Berry, and the French woman of letters uh, Madame de Dufont. Six entire volumes of the stupendous Yale edition of Horace Walpole's letters are devoted to his correspondence with Madame de Dufont, which was conducted entirely in French. Three more of those volumes are devoted uh, to his correspondence with Lady Ossory, and two to that with Mary and Agnes Berry. Despite all this, he's often depicted as a misogynist because of his depiction of Mary Wollstonecraft in a letter to Hannah More as, quote, a hyena in petticoats. This is often supposed wrongly to be a reaction to Wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of woman, but it isn't. It refers specifically to her treatise and historical and moral view of the French Revolution, 1794, in which Wollstonecraft commends the French for having executed their queen. The passage in question is the final paragraph of his letter to Hannah More. And I'm going to share the screen now, I hope, so that you can see uh, my first quotation. Good, we have it. So it reads, adieu thou excellent woman, thou reverse of that hyena in petticoats, Mrs. Wollstonecroft who to this day discharges her ink and gall on Marie Antoinette, whose unparalleled sufferings have not yet staunched that electo's blazing ferocity. And it's important to consider the context here. Walpole's critique of Wollstonecraft was anti-revolutionary, but by no means anti-feminist. And this of course is something I'd be happy to come back to uh, after my presentation. Uh, the painting you have here of Horace Walpole by John uh, Eckhart, now in the National Portrait Gallery, shows him uh, in front of his uh, beloved uh, Strawberry Hill, uh, his home for over 50 years, the last 50 years of his life, which he gradually turned into a miniature Gothic castle. And here you have a, a depiction of straw, a photograph of Strawberry Hill in 2012, after its lavish restoration, uh, paid for by national lottery funding and uh, looking quite splendid here in glittering white and uh, uh, of course very much visible today uh, if you're in that part of uh, in that part of England uh, not very far from London. Uh, it was here in Strawberry Hill that he wrote both his gothic novel The Castle of Otranto um, and his gothic tragedy The Mysterious Mother and it's The Castle of Otranto that gives us our best link with Jane Austen whose birthday we're all celebrating today, because of course uh, she's parodying Gothic fiction in that novel, and his Gothic novel is the grandfather of all Gothic fiction. Among the many other works that Walpole produced at Strawberry Hill were two that I shall be discussing today. The letter from Zoho, a Chinese philosopher at London to his friend Lian Chi at Peking, 1757, and Hieroglyphic Tales, 1785. Walpole was wealthy enough to install his own printing press at Strawberry Hill. And its publications included both The Mysterious Mother, his Gothic tragedy, 
in a tiny limited edition and it's um, and the hieroglyphic tales in a still more restricted edition of a mere seven copies, all of which he retained in his own possession. Walpole was a strange man in many ways, and this uh, extraordinary desire to control his own publications is uh, one of the oddest things about him. And of course, having your own printing press enables you to do that. Those works, though, were published very shortly after his death, when a five volume collected edition of his works appeared, and they attracted the attention of several contemporary reviewers, including Francis Burney's father, Dr. Charles Burney. Uh, one other thing I'd like to add about Strawberry Hill Press, well, uh, is that um, it also published work by, works by women. Uh, this was always important to Walpole. Uh, he was the first to publish a long poem by Hannah Moore, um, Bishop Bonner's Ghost, and the first to bring together the poetry of one of his friends, Lady Temple. Uh, he published an edition of her collected poems, which has been very much neglected, I would say, by modern scholars. Uh, but I throw this out for anyone interested in working on Lady Temple and her connections with Horace Walpole. Uh, I would think you'd have a new subject there should you choose to do so. The breadth of Walpole's interests are astonishing. He worked in such diverse genres as prose fiction, tragic and comic drama, poetry, literary criticism, historical works, political and social satire, and journal writing. His reputation as the founder of the Gothic novel and drama, as the author of major works of art and garden history, and as the creator of Strawberry Hill has endured. Less well known though, is his early fascination with China and chinoiserie. Initially an advocate for all matters Chinese, he later turned his back on his youthful enthusiasm for reasons which I should consider in this talk. Now, Walpole was one of the many 18th century European authors who took an interest in China without ever crossing or approaching its borders. The furthest east that he ever traveled was to Naples during his grand tour of Europe, undertaken in 1739 to 41 with the poet Thomas Gray when he was in his early 20s. Later, Walpole contented himself with occasional visits to Paris, the last in 1775. But he did begin reading about China from an early age. And what you see here is the title page of uh, a book that he was reading as an 18 year old undergraduate at King's College, Cambridge, uh, Jean-Baptiste Jean Duhal's Description Géographique historique, chronologique, politique et physique de l'Empire de la Chine, which had been newly published in an opulent four-volume folio edition. Walpole's annotated copy of this monumental work, the standard 18th century source for information on China in both France and England, it was quickly translated into English too, is housed at Yale University's Lewis Walpole Library, the library dedicated to Horace Walpole's works. Here you can see uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, Walpole's book plate and the handwritten shelf mark that he later gave to the four volumes indicating their place in his library at Strawberry Hill. So the book plate, Mr. Horatio Walpole using his, uh, the full version of his first name. In October of that year, uh, 1735, he wrote glowing accounts of Duell's description to two correspondents, one of them his Cambridge tutor, John Whaley, a fellow of King's, and to the Whig politician, John Lord Harvey, himself a Sinophile, who had sent Walpole the book. And that of course was one of the great advantages of being the son of the prime minister. You would receive gifts like that um, from your father's colleagues. In this case, an extremely expensive and highly desirable publication on China. Neither of Walpole's letters have survived but his fascination with Duald is evident from his correspondence replies. Whaley, his tutor at King's, jests with his young charge, whose thoughts, Whaley writes, must, quote, be employed on the other side of the Ganges with a Mandarin on the top of a mountain in the province of Quentong. Harvey writes that he is, quote, glad to hear the history of China has so strong an effect upon you and praises Walpole for describing in, quote, a very entertaining matter, the change it has made in you, but adds, notwithstanding my partiality to China, I advise you, if you can, to continue an Englishman. Walpole would later obtain other books on China, 
including Sir William Chambers' designs of China, Chinese buildings and Isidore, Isidore Elmont's Fait Mémorable des Empereurs de la Chine. But none of those works was, was as significant as Du Alde's. Samuel Johnson, a near contemporary of Walpole, was also a reader of Du Alde and in 1742 published a life of Confucius in the Gentleman's Magazine, using Du Alde as his only source while adding some typically Johnsonian reflections of his own. And I know that many of you in the audience will be familiar with uh, Johnson's famous advice to Boswell, urging him, if he can, to visit the Great Wall of China, which Boswell had ex expressed an interest in seeing. And Johnson's uh, uh, typically original uh, grounds for advising Boswell to do so was, the history, was that Boswell's children would subsequently, subsequently be able to say that their father had visited the Great Wall of China and that this would give them status long after their father's death. Walpole's early immersion in the Al's magisterial work seems to have worked on his imagination over the years. Initially, he was much taken by Chinese innovations in landscape gardening. In a letter of 1750 to his friend Sir Horace Mann, the British plenipotentiary at Florence, Walpole wrote, I am almost as fond of the sharawaji or Chinese want of symmetry in buildings as in grounds or gardens. I'm sure whenever you come to England, you'll be pleased with the liberty of taste into which we are struck and of which you can have no idea. The term he uses here, Sharawadji, had first been used by Sir William Temple in his 1692 essay upon the gardens of Epicurus to describe the beauty created by irregularity in landscape gardening. Although the origin of the word remains uncertain, its meaning is clear. And for the younger Walpole, the asymmetry and informality of Chinese garden design were far preferable to the artificiality of French garden styles. Under the influence of Du Alda in 1752, he named the diminutive goldfish pond at his beloved Strawberry Hill, Po Yang, with characteristic irony, since Po Yang, according to Du Alda, is, quote, a large lake in Yangtze province celebrated for its plentiful fish. Walpole was also, like most collectors of ceramics of his age, an enthusiast for oriental porcelain. He had a large number of such pieces housed in a specially designed china room at Strawberry Hill, as well as others scattered around the house, about 100 in all. Much the most famous of these items is the superb china goldfish bowl made in about 1730 with cobalt decorations and lead glaze, now owned by the Earl of Derby. And this bowl is famous, uh, rightly so, uh, because it was commemorated by Thomas Gray in his wonderful poem, Ode on the Death of a Favorite Cat Drowned in a Tub of Goldfishes, written in 1747 and commemorating the sad fate of Horace Walpole's cat. And I shall read from the first uh, six lines. "'Twas on a lofty vase's side where China's gayest art had died, the azure flowers that blow, demurest of the tabby kind, the pensive cellar reclined, gazed on the lake below." And uh, most of you will know, I think, uh, how poor Selma met her fate uh, trying to reach into the vase and scoop out the goldfish that was swimming in there she herself fell into the bars and was unable to extricate herself. And Walpole sadly found her there, uh, but uh, took her take some solace, I think, in the fact that she was commemorated in this, uh, in this celebrated poem. Interestingly as well to me, he kept the China uh, vase all his life. Uh, it never left Strawberry Hill, even though it had been the, uh, the reason for poor Selma's death. Uh, later on, though, he mounted it on a Gothic, uh, on a Gothic base, uh, and I will be talking about the clash between China and the China, Chinoiserie and the Gothic in this talk, uh, and I think this is a wonderfully vivid example of Walpole's, uh, somehow, if you like, softening the effect of the Chinese vase by putting it on a Gothic mount in this fashion. 
1753, uh, together with several other poems by Gray, uh, the Ode on the Cat was illustrated by Richard Bentley, a member of Walpole's Strawberry Committee. And I hope you can see Selma the cat perched on the edge of the goldfish bowl there, and two other cats, one on the top left and one on the top right uh, of the drawing. Uh, the one on the left is angling uh, into an urn. You can just about see the, the angling rod on the left-hand side of the picture. And on the right, I'm afraid you can't see uh, a net that's being used by the, uh, by the other cat. But clearly this was an event that attracted not only Gray's poetry, but uh, Bentley's uh, visual talents, uh, uh, all because of the famous Chinese vase. Um, Bentley also drew this sketch for a Chinese building intended for Strawberry Hill, which never materialized, uh, but it is fascinating to conjecture uh, that at one point Walpole was at least contemplating the possibility of putting up uh, outbuildings uh, in the Strawberry Hill grounds, such as this one, which would, of course would have had a drastically different effect uh, from what uh, he would ultimately do to the buildings. Despite his early taste for Chinese gardening, buildings and ceramics, Walpole gradually grew tired of the vogue. From about 1753 onwards, his celebrated advocacy of the Gothic was often set against the rage for chinoiserie. In a letter to John Shute of August 1753, he writes of a visit to the Earl of Guildford's seat at Roxton. He is delighted by the interior, but finds the park disfigured by several paltry Chinese buildings and bridges, which have the merit or demerit of being the progenitors of a very numerous race all over the kingdom. He made that remark just five months after an anonymous periodical essay voiced some similar sentiments. This is in 1753. Not one in a thousand of all the styles, gates, rails, pails, chairs, temples, chimney pieces, etc., 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 which are called Chinese, has the least resemblance to anything that China ever saw. Nor would an English church be a less uncommon sight to a traveling Mandarin than an English pagoda. Nine years later, in a letter to his old friend George Montague, Walpole writes about Richard Bateman's house at Old Windsor, which had recently been remodeled. Walpole writes, I did not doubt that you would approve Mr. Bateman's since it has changed its religion. I converted it from Chinese to Gothic. And in a letter to the Earl of Stafford of 1781, much later, Walpole again refers to his part in changing the aspect of Bateman's estate. He was proud, he declares, of having converted Dickie Bateman from a Chinese to a Goth. Though he, Bateman, was the founder of the Sharawaji taste in England, I preached so effectually that his every pagoda took the veil. A wonderful resonant Walpolean phrase is every pagoda took the veil. For all his love of Gothic, there is a part of Walpole that respected classical verities and his architectural respect for good second generation Palladianism, such as that of the early Adam, is the underlying base from which he dismisses déclassé Chinese fripperies. And here's, a, I think, a lovely example of a, of a Chinese frippery uh, given to me by the Lewis Walpole Library, this image. Um, uh, it's called a common councilman of Candlestick Ward and his wife on a visit to Mr. Deputy at his modern built villa near Clapham. And so you can see this modern built villa has been uh, given these Chinese accoutrements. Uh, most notably the dragon perched up there and the, uh, the, the, the dome beside the, 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 the dragon. Um, and the title of the, of the satire is so telling, A Common Councilman. And you can see why this would make Walpole recoil from the vogue for, 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 for the Chinese vogue. Anything common was anathema to Walpole. Uh, and once he decided that the Chinese style had become vulgar, he was certainly going to distance himself from it. The focal point for his increasing antipathy to Chinese influence on English gardens was Sir William Chambers, who had spent several months in Canton in 1743 to 44, one of the very few English uh, writers who had actually been to China, and then again in 48 to 49, 
1748 to 9, working as an agent of the Swedish East India Company and studying Chinese architecture and garden design. On reading Chambers's dissertation on Oriental gardening of 1772, Walpole wrote to William Mason that it was more extravagant than the worst Chinese paper, by which he meant wallpaper. Uh, Chinese wallpaper had been popular in England since the 17th century, but Walpole was now averse to it too. He also mocked the extraordinary Chinese pagoda in the Royal Garden at Kew that Chambers had designed in 1761, terming it the Tower of Kew, which he claimed would be visible from Yorkshire. And of course, you could still see that pagoda today in Kew Gardens. Mason's response to Chambers's dissertation took the form of a satirical poem, an heroic epistle to Sir William Chambers, to which Walpole subsequently contributed a commentary. In one of his notes, Walpole explains his objections to Chambers' theories at length. And I quote, Sir William Chambers, who was far from wanting taste in architecture, fell into the mistake of the French, who supposed that the Chinese had discovered the true style in gardens long before Kent. And in order to deprive him and England of the honor of originality, the French call our style the Anglo-Chinois garden whereas the Chinese wander as far from nature as the French themselves, though in opposite extremes. Regularity, uniformity, formality, and sameness are the characteristics of all French gardens. Irregularity and extravagance of the Chinese. Nature is artfully and laboriously and, uh, avoided and destroyed by both. In a previous note, Walpole describes William Kent uh, the, or, as the author of the modern taste in English gardens, or in other words, the first to discover that the imitation of nature was the true style in gardening, as in all other arts. William Kent was one of Walpole's heroes. In both instances, the key term is nature. It is the unnatural qualities of the French gardens, uh, of French and Chinese tastes in gardens, whether caused by excessive uniformity or by its opposite wild irregularity that Walpole condemns. Chambers, he continues, has had as, had, has had as baleful an influence on garden design as extravagant set designers have had on the London stage. And this is the quote I want to read now. To send us to the vagaries of the Chinese was exactly that passion for pantomime that has been a reproach to our theater. To recommend the introduction of bears, monkeys, elephants, etc., into our gardens was identically what has been practiced on our stage. And whether His Majesty or the mob would be delighted with such a sight, with such sights at Kew or Drury Lane, the idea is barbarous and never to be admitted into our real landscapes. Walpole, you can see here, holds the monarch, George III, at least partly responsible for the excesses taking place in English gardens and theatres. Chambers's pagoda at Kew was built for the royal family, whose corrupt taste, in Walpole's view, was likewise responsible for the corruption of the London stage. Politics and taste are intertwined here. As ardent a Whig as his prime minister father, Walpole, like his fellow Whig Mason, had an instinctive antipathy to the court and its Tory acolytes, such as Chambers. And I'm now going to turn to Zhou Ho. Just as Walpole turned against chinoiserie in his writings on landscape gardening, his deployment of China in his imaginative works also changed radically in his later years. In the remainder of this talk, I should be concerned with his pamphlet of 1757, a letter from Zhou Ho, a Chinese philosopher at London, to his friend Lian Qi at Peking and with his hieroglyphic tales of 1785, and to the very different uses to which China is put in those two works. In a brief autobiographical account, which he entitled Short Notes of the Life of Horatio Walpole, the author describes the impetus behind the letter from Zhou Ho. And I quote again, in February, 1757, I vacated my seat for Castle Rising, where he was, uh, uh, the um, 
uh, the, the Member of Parliament, in order to be chosen for Lynn, and at about the same time used my utmost endeavours, but in vain, to save the unfortunate Admiral Bing. May the 12th of that year, I wrote in less than an hour and a half the letter from Zo Ho. It was published on the 17th and immediately passed through five editions. The unfortunate Admiral John Bing had been court-martialed at the end of December 1756, sentenced to death and executed by firing squad on the quarterdeck of the ship Monarch in Portsmouth Harbor in March 1757. Bing had been found guilty of negligence in failing to prevent French forces from taking possession of Menorca. Modern historians are divided over the extent of Bing's responsibility for what was seen as a humiliating defeat. But for Walpole, the situation was clear. Bing, he believed, had been unjustly accused. He was a scapegoat whose death was designed to appease the people's anger and especially the resentment of city merchants who regarded the naval bases of Gibraltar and Menorca as essential for the prosperity of Mediterranean trade. George II and other members of the royal family were also bent on Bing's execution, as were the Prime Minister William Pitt, the Duke of Newcastle, and most members of the cabinet. Bing's death would be a grim warning to all ranks of the British Army and Navy, as the hero is memorably informed in Voltaire's Condide, 1759, Dans ce pays-ci, il est bon de tuer de temps en temps un amiral pour encourager les autres. Uh, in this country, it's just as well from time to time to kill an admiral in order to encourage the others. Although Walpole was absent from Parliament during a crucial period in February, shortly before Bing's execution, when pleas for clemency were being heard, he did do his utmost for the admiral behind the scenes. But his efforts were ultimately fruitless. Two months after Bing's execution, Walpole wrote a letter from Zoho, a mordantly witty satirical tract responding to the maneuverings around Bing's court martial and more generally to the follies of the age. In using the persona of a London-based Chinese commentator, Walpole was drawing on a substantial tradition of foreign observer fiction. The earliest example is Giovanni Marana's Letters Writ by a Turkish Spy, 1684, written originally in French by an Italian in the character of a Turk visiting Paris, so a thoroughly international work. Its successors include Defoe's continuation of letters writ by a Turkish spy, Montesquieu's Lettre Persane, of which Walpole owned a copy, Lord Littleton's imitation of Montesquieu, Letters from a Persian in England, and Françoise de Graffigny's Lettre d'une Peruvienne, which was immediately translated into English as letters written by a Peruvian princess. Walpole also had a specifically pseudo-Chinese precursor in the Lettre Chinoise by the Marquis uh, d'Argent, in which four Chinese travelers writing from Nagasaki, Isfahan, Moscow, and Paris send their observations to one another and to their correspondent at Peking in Che Chan. In a letter from Zoho, Walpole creates a courteous Chinese observer who is perpetually baffled by everything about England, its dreadful weather, its incomprehensible politics, its bloodthirsty monarch, its strange social customs, and above all, by what Zoho regards as the disgraceful execution of the innocent Admiral Bing, who in his laconic summary of the case was, quote, tried, acquitted, condemned, and put to death. In Walpole's own deft precy, his pamphlet was a summary of melancholy truths, but which, as my nature is rather inclined to smile, I have placed in a ridiculous light. The ridicule extends to the philosopher's name, Zoho, which looks Chinese, at least to Westerners, but was probably intended to echo the word Soho, a district located in the heart of London. The suggestion then is that the Chinese traveler observes English politics with a clearer gaze than that of English men and women living in the capital. Reason in China is not reason in England, as Zoho memorably declares. 
Walpole's brief pamphlet, sold in London for six months and published anonymously, was remarkably successful. He had consulted some of his friends and associates, including Henry Fox and George Grenville, before its publication, and gave copies to several others, including George Montague, Kitty Clive, and Horace Mann. Their responses were generally positive, although Fox claimed to be puzzled by one passage, and Clive exclaimed, Lord, you'll be sent to the tower, allowing Walpole a splendid riposte. Well, said I coolly, my father was there before me, alluding to Sir Robert Walpole's uh, six months, I think several months imprisonment in the tower in the 1720s. The first edition of May 1757 was rapidly followed by four more, the last appearing in June. A substantial excerpt from the letter was also printed in a newspaper, the London Chronicle. Montague found that it reads very well in that manner. Walpole would also have been gratified by the reviews of his pamphlet. The monthly review described it as an ingenious satire on our late political revolutions and particularly, particularly on the inconstant disposition of the English nation. It was, quote, written in the manner of Montesquieu's, Montesquieu's Persian letters, though it was not equal to the celebrated original. The critical review commended the ingenious Zoho for his strokes of true humor. Intriguingly, the reviewer, unlike his counterpart in the monthly, had apparently discovered Walpole's authorship, noting that Zoho, quote, though but lately arrived in these parts, seems to be as well acquainted with old England as if he'd been born and bred in the country of N, dash. And N here is presumably an abbreviation of Norfolk, the, ca the county in which Sir Robert Walpole's seat, Houghton Hall, is located. Although in fact, Walpole, Horace Walpole, was born at his father's house in London. Another positive review appeared in the journal, Journal Encyclopédique, also comparing the satirical technique to that of Montesquieu in Lettres Persanes, while quoting extensively from the piece in French translation. And I now move to the last part of my talk, uh, The Hieroglyphic Tales, where we see Walpole's continuing fascination with China. There are six tales, all surrealistic fantasies. In a letter of 1779, Walpole termed them strange things, even wilder than the castle of Otranto. And as I've mentioned, Walpole made sure that nobody could read them in his lifetime. Those six copies that he printed at Strawberry Hill Press were kept at Strawberry Hill. Possibly friends could read them uh, on site, but they couldn't take them away with them. Uh, and no one would be able to, there, there was no public uh, readership of the hieroglyphic tales until 1798, a year after Walpole's death. Most of the tales were written between 1766 and 1772, but the fifth, My Lie, a Chinese fairy tale, that's spelled M-I-L-I, My Lie, must have been written after the death in 1778 of Lord William Campbell, described in the story as, quote, the late governor of Carolina, and thus probably in the 1780s, and probably in the 1780s, when Walpole's close friend and cousin, Henry Seymour Conway, undertook some of the Chinese-themed landscaping projects that feature in the tale. My Lie, and I think there's a deliberate pun here on My Lie, L-I-E, M-Y-L-I-E, uh, which would be an apt term for fiction itself, features a Chinese prince who travels to England in search of his bride. My Lie has been told by his fairy godmother, Hai, that, quote, he would be the most unhappy man alive. Sorry, I should be, uh, I should be showing you uh, uh, the uh, title page of Hieroglyphic Tales. You have it here. And you can see here, uh, printed by Thomas Kergate, that's Walpole's own printer, uh, whom he employed at Strawberry Hill. Um, uh, the, um, my lie has been told by his fairy godmother, High that he, quote, would be the most unhappy man alive unless he married a princess whose name was the same with her father's dominions. This prophecy sends the prince from his native Peking to Canton, from where he set sail to Dublin on what proves to be a wild goose chase. He then proceeds to England, where he hopes that Joseph Banks would be a suitable guide, en route to Oxford in search of Banks, 
My life finds himself at Park Place near Henley, the estate of Conway and Conway's wife, Lady Aylesbury. And here, my life at last discovers his intended, Conway's orphan niece, Caroline Campbell, daughter of Lord William Campbell, whose first name, Caroline, is indeed almost the same as her father's former dominion in America, Carolina. There are some intriguing links between this tale and Walpole's writings on English versus Chinese gardens. Walpole used the story to pay tribute to the extensive improvement to the grounds of Park Place, which Conway had purchased as his country seat in 1752. After making his way through a venerable wood of beeches that Conway had soundly left untouched, My Lai arrives at, quote, a menagerie commanding a more glorious prospect than any in his father's dominions and full of Chinese pheasants. The point is that Conway's English garden eclipses anything to be found in China, and the imported Chinese pheasants in the fashionable menagerie outdo their native counterparts. My Lai also discovers the grotto, the artificial ruins, the rustic bridge, the cottage, the farmhouse, and the tomb that adorn Park Place, for each of which Walpole added an explanatory note expounding its attractions. Thus the tomb is, quote, in a beautiful spot by the river, built for a point of view. It has a small pyramid on it. But My Lai, we are told, is insensible to such enchanting scenes. Being Chinese, he is incapable of appreciating the attractions of an English garden. Because of his dancing gait, Conway's garden concluded that he was a Frenchman. As in the history of the modern taste in gardening, Walpole links Chinese and French lack of understanding together. And the union is far from satisfying, since Caroline's only attraction for my lie is her name which apparently fulfills his fairy godmother's prophecy. Even in this respect, though, the union is problematic, since the original prophecy had said nothing about the dominions of the bride's father, Carolina, having been lost. Now, if Conway is the hero of my lie, Sir Joseph Banks is its villain. On the surface, Walpole maintained polite relations with Banks, who was 25 years his junior, they corresponded occasionally and met on social occasions, seeming to respect each other. But to close friends such as Horace Mann, Walpole painted a highly unflattering picture of the great naturalist and explorer. In a letter of 1772, Walpole tells Mann that Zoffany's journey to Florence, where he was painting a view of the Tribune, is, quote, better than his going with that wild man Banks who is poaching in every ocean for the fry of little islands that escape the dragnet of Spain. And in 1783, he returns to the charge, inquiring rhetorically, when the arts are brought to such perfection in Europe, who would go like Sir Joseph Banks in search of islands in the Atlantic, where the natives have in 6,000 years not improved the science of carving fishing hooks out of bones or flints. These remarks with a disdain for non-European cultures throw light, I believe, on the part Banks is made to play in the confrontation between Chinese and English values that runs through my lie. The prince wishes to seek out Banks in England after being told by the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland that the explorer was, quote, going all over the world in search of he did not know what like my lie himself. In England, he learns, the sage Banks was at Oxford, hunting in the Bodleian Library for a manuscript voyage of a man who had been in the moon, which Mr. Banks thought must have been in the Western Ocean where the moon sets, and which planet, if he could discover once more, he would take possession of in his majesty's name upon condition that it should never be taxed and so be lost again to this country like the rest of his majesty's dominions in that part of the world. With his rage to colonize the moon as a substitute for the former American colonies and his global search for he did not know what, Banks is clearly a target of Walpole's satire. In one of his notes on my lie, 
Walpole describes Banks as, quote, the gentleman who discovered Otahahiti in, in company with Dr. Solander. A letter of 1784, sorry, a letter of 1780 from Walpole to William Cole depicts Banks, however, as far from gentlemanly. How I abominate Mr. Banks and Dr. Solander, who routed the poor Otahaitians out of the center of the ocean and carried our abominable passions amongst them. Not even that poor little speck could escape European restlessness. 45 years after reading and singing the praises of the L's volumes on China, and 23 years after writing a letter from Zoho, Walpole has entirely, has entirely changed his tune. Far from sympathizing with European exploration of China and the South Seas, Walpole has become an isolationist. And as late as 1787, in a letter to Conway, Walpole was still dwelling on his Chinese hieroglyphic tale, telling his correspondent, if I were not too old to have any, imagine left, any imagination left, I would add a sequel to my lie. No such sequel would appear, but Walpole did live to see the failure of Lord McCarthy's embassy to China in 1792 to four, in which, in which McCartney tried unsuccessfully to get permission for a ministry based in China to look after the interests of British subjects there. This and all of McCartney's requests were denied. In a letter to Lady Ossery of August 1794, written shortly after McCartney's return to London, Walpole tells her, this is my final slide, I'm not at all surprised at Lord McCartney's miscarriage, nor can help admiring the prudence of the Chinese. They would be distracted to connect with Europeans and cannot be ignorant of our usurpations in India. Though they may be ignorant of Peruvian and Mexican histories and the no less shocking transactions in France. The letter, I believe, throws new light on Walpole's views. In his later years, he was not only isolationist, but staunchly anti-imperialist too. The word usurpations is telling. England's imperial project in India, like that of Spain in Peru and Mexico, was anathema to Walpole. This was not, I believe, what Lord Harvey had in mind when he advised the eager young Cambridge student to quote, continue an Englishman. In turning his back on China, Walpole was also distancing himself from the colonial projects of Britain, Spain, France, and all of the imperial powers. He should, I believe, be remembered not as an anti-feminist, but rather as an anti-colonialist, who like the great Sinophile Du Alde, was fascinated by China without wishing to make it part of the ever expanding British Empire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. I, I personally love Walpole and it was so fascinating to hear about, you know, we talk so much about Castle of Otranto to hear about some of his other works. Mm. I'd like to remind everyone in the audience that you can still submit questions to the Q&A box down on that bottom screen as we ask Peter your questions. I may just and quickly quickly respond if I may to, to, to Abby. I, 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 you, you've you've touched a nerve because I could, I entirely agree with you. Uh, it's such a shame that uh, I, I mean it's it, customer trend is a fascinating work, and of course we're all interested in it because of the Jane Austen connection. But it's such a shame that it it's tended to overshadow everything else that he wrote. And uh, there are other authors of whom this is true. You know, uh, the, the monks say with with, with Lewis and uh, others I can think of when we really should be reading Walpole's work. Uh, in a much larger, much broader fashion. And uh, that was certainly my aim today, to try to introduce something other than the Castle of Otranto uh, to, uh, uh, to the audience. So thank you for that, <laughs> that point, Anne. And we sent around Zoho and MyLai before, and we'll send it around again. And I highly recommend Zoho because it is still very witty and very funny even to this day. So. To start off our Q&A while we wait for some questions to come in, I was wondering if you would talk a little bit more about what travel would have been like for English people or Europeans to East Asia. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it, the, I mean, the obvious answer, it would have taken a very long time. Uh, it would uh, take most of a year to sail from, uh, from, from, uh, from England to China. And uh, of course, another year to get back, which is why the, the, the dates given for instance, the McCartney expedition of 1782 to 84. It left uh, um, London in late 1782, uh, arrived in uh, China in uh, late 1783, and came back in the summer of 84, only having spent a, a relatively short time in China. So, I mean, one obvious point to make is if you wanted to go to China, you'd better go there for a, a pretty long stay. Uh, if it was going to take you, you know, the best part of two years to get there and back. Uh, perhaps this is something we're going to be doing in the future, the way that uh, flights seem to be going. Uh, uh, but uh, certainly at that time, I, th I mean, th th that's the, f the first thing to say, just the, the length of time it would take. And of course, it was a dangerous journey too. Uh, many things could go wrong or route, including the danger of, of, of pirates and certainly the danger of, of shipwreck. Um, so uh, when Vincent Johnson was encouraging Boswell to go to the Great War of China and telling him that, you know, he would be known as, uh, his children would be known as the sons of the man who'd been to the Great War of China, I think he was thinking partly of the, of the danger, the difficulty of the journey, just getting there and, get it, and coming back in one piece. Uh, would be quite a challenge. Not to mention, of course, all the language barriers you would find once you once you got there. He um, uh, wasn't trying to get rid of Boswell, was he? No. Uh, well, <laughs> that thought had, had occurred to me. And I'm interesting, Johnson. Yeah, I mean, there's only so much Boswell you can take, right? right. Um, but I mean, Johnson actually said that he himself would have liked to have gone to the Great War of China. It was, you know, he realized that his ages was no longer possible. Although, of course, he did get to the uh, did, get, did get to the Hebrides. But he was fascinated by long distance travel, and uh, uh, as were many other Englishmen of the of the day. But of course, exceedingly few of them actually made it, which is why Sir William Chambers is so interesting, uh, so it's so important. Uh, um, du Alder himself, by the way, I, sh I should say, did not get to China. Uh, he was a French uh, Jesuit missionary, uh, but he himself wasn't posted in China, but he drew on the uh, works of numerous other French missionaries who had been there and did a tremendous job at extracting uh, information from them uh, and writing it up into this, into this uh, uh, four volume work, which really was the standard authority for views on China for much of the 18th century, both in, in, in French and then uh, quickly in English too. One of our participants, uh, drawing on your final uh, statement, very provocative last line of your talk, um, asks, as an anti-colonialist, was Walpole in favor of independence for the American colonies? Uh, yes, well, uh, his take on that was, again, uh, different, from, uh, different from Johnson's. Um, I mean, as you know, uh, I'm sure many of you will know, Johnson uh, was wholly unsympathetic to the uh, Americans' uh, desire for independence and thought they were rascals for, for demanding it, uh, as, of course, did George III. Uh, Walpole, no, he had a more nuanced take on the, uh, on the situation and uh, wasn't entirely pro-American, but was certainly sympathetic to the Americans' uh, um, uh, claims, which is not surprising since at that stage of his life he was getting more and more disaffected with, with English government. So uh, interestingly, although it's Johnson who's, uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's both Johnson and Walpole have had strong followings in, in the present day United States and Walpole, as many of you will know, most of all for the great W.S. Lewis, who uh, was the founder of what is now the Lewis Walpole Library. Uh, an extraordinary uh, collection of Walpole's own uh, works uh, and uh, much of the uh, uh, interior of Strawberry Hill uh, was bought up by Lewis and taken to far shipped to Farmington uh, into what was then originally his own house and later turned into what's now part of Yale University, the, the Lewis Walpole Library. One of Lewis's aims was to uh, uh, collect every book that Walpole owned and uh, Du Al's volumes is one that he did succeed in getting. Some slipped through the net, uh, much to his chagrin, and the Lewis Walpole Library is still acquiring uh, uh, books uh, that have been in Walpole's library uh, when they come on the market. And of course, Walp uh, Lewis also bought uh, manuscripts, uh, including numerous uh, Walpole letters, which became the foundation of the uh, Yale edition of uh, Horace Walpole's correspondence that I've mentioned in this talk. Um Peter, uh, is it okay to ask a question from myself? Um, of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah. 
um, Horace Walpole's letter from Zoho was fascinating. I, I didn't actually know anything about this. And you mentioned this Chinese writers writing from Nagasaki. Did was did I hear wrong? Or? <laughs> uh, Na Nagasaki, I think you did hear. No, I don't think I mentioned Nagasaki. What, what was oh, you the said, word? Yeah, you did say, I think you said, you mentioned a, a Chinese, I mean, a Japanese city and an Indian city, but they were Chinese people, which, which is entirely possible in the 18th century. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I just, <laughs> I just I'll find, thought, I'll find, oh. my, I'll find my notes on that. Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah uh, sorry. Maybe it was me just hearing. No, I, I heard the same thing. But... Yeah. <laughs> I was just fascinated. I didn't, I could never link up Walpole with Japan or even like um, in China. Uh, I, I, so... I, I, I know the part you're, re you're referring to, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to track it down just a second. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and actually, what, what I was trying to say about this mention of Nagasaki was that it it just reminded me of George Salman Azar's form. Oh, right. Okay. Well, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, yeah. It's kind of strange, strange tales that these 18th century uh, men wrote. Okay. I, 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 I got to get to, I'll get to the Salman Azar in a moment, but just to, yeah. on, on Nagasaki, okay, okay, I found it. It's, okay. um, it, the, the reason you you got me slightly confused. It's it's not actually in Zoho. It's it's in it's in the Lettres Chinoises by the Mach, uh, oh. Mach de Jean. He's right, the one okay. of the four Chinese travelers uh, uh -huh. writing one. And you're quite right. Nagasaki is one of them. Uh, <laughs> okay. The other is Isfahan, Moscow, and Paris. So these Chinese travelers are spreading around. Yes, right. sending their observations to one another and uh -huh. to a correspondent in Peking. So right. it is extraordinary, but it's not actually Horace Walpole. Uh, but I okay. think it was an important influence on, on, on Horace uh -huh. Walpole's letter from Zoho. And of course, but, uh, Salman, yeah. Salman Azar is an extraordinary uh, <laughs> well, and I mean, it, it, kind of goes, it kind of goes back to the earlier question that, that you asked out about people's you know, knowledge of China or ability to get to China. Mm. And the fact that Salman Azar, who I believe was French uh, by birth, could pass himself yeah. off as being a, a Formosan. Yeah. <laughs> And including a language that he claimed, uh, to, to, you know, was was for yeah. most, and yeah. took in a, a large number of people in doing so, and befriended yeah. many people, again including Samuel Johnson. Uh, mm -hmm. He got on very well with Johnson, and uh, also it's also Samuel Richardson. Mm -hmm. uh, remarkable how, how well connected he became, and how people didn't uh, denounce him as an imposter, but they really took him very seriously. So let's yeah. hope we've come a we've come a little way <laughs> since then. Huh? <sighs> Thank you so much for answering my question. It was fascinating. Uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Kimia. Yeah, thank you. And would you like to go next? Yeah. Yes. So we have a question from the audience about were there Chinese people living in London at that time? And if so, do we have any idea what they might have thought about the British interest in all things Chinese? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's a great question. It's a really, really good question. I, I, I can't answer it. I mean, I, I. I've come across virtually no uh, mentions of Chinese people living in living in London in, in Walpole's uh, uh, age. Uh, no doubt that would become, you know, more of that the case in in the nineteenth century. But I think it would be exceedingly unusual for uh, anybody Chinese to, to to be actually living in in, in London in the eighteenth century. I can imagine them visiting in the same way that these you know small number of English people visited China. Um, but I'm not familiar with Chinese writings, I mean, genuine Chinese writings about London, as opposed to the pseudo Chinese writings that I've been discussing. It's a great question, though, and uh, I'm sure there are people who would be able to answer it. Perhaps perhaps Inga would know more about this than I do. <laughs> no, I don't. Um, or, 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 or Kimio, I don't know. No, <laughs> no sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, I guess there's like there are a couple of people who are in in honor of Jane Austen's birthday. We have to make at least some connection here to to uh, to her. So um, speaking of the did, did Jane Austen go to China? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> the, well, well, Fanny Price does, right? That um, so yes, that's true. Yes. Um, so I true. think wanted to ask um, your this is based on a couple of our our audience questions here. Um, what what is your opinion on on why uh, Austin chooses to have Fanny Price read about the McCartney mission um, mm. in in Mansfield Park? And do we do um, do you have any other thoughts about Austin's views um, regarding China? Well, it's, it's a it's a great question again, and uh, I mean it's a nice way, of course, of bringing Jane Austen into the 
conversation. Uh, I, I think a few people have been uh, writing about this recently and connecting it with both the, uh, you know, the appearance of the slave trade in, in, in uh, Emma uh, and, in Mansfield, and in Mansfield Park itself. Uh, and I like to think that, um, you know, possibly Austin's take on the McCartney expedition might have been somewhat similar to Horace Walpole's, namely sort of cheering on the Chinese, as it were, for having rejected McCartney's overtures on the grounds that if they'd accepted them, they would have soon found themselves, they could have found themselves in the position of, 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 of India. So it would be, it, it, but of course, it's, you know, we, we could only speculate, right? Uh, Austin loves to plant these, uh, these, tan these, these teasers, right? These tantalizing lines like Fanny Price is reading McCartney, but then not, you know, not giving us any more on this. And as far as I know, she, I don't think she ever refers to, the, to, to McCartney in her letters. I, I, I think I've, I, I looked for, I mean, I think at one point when I was looking at the McCartney reference in Manchester Park, I tried to find some non-fictional reference to McCartney and couldn't find one anywhere in Austin. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can put a more positive spin on the McCartney expedition. I mean, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Charles Burney, for instance, uh, asked members of the expedition to do all they could to come back with information on Chinese music. And that, of course, was perfectly admirable of, uh, admirable of him. Uh, he wanted to use that information to expand his history of music, um, uh, to, to uh, include references to non-European music, at, uh, which, which was, I think, a very worthy endeavor. But of course, that was far from being the primary aim of the, uh, of, of the McCartney expedition, which was very much a thing to establish a toehold for the British in China. And I think it would have been, uh, uh, you know, just as they had long, long previously done in India, and, and we all know what happened there. So, I, I like to think that you know that, that Austin would have taken a similar stand to, 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 to Walpole had we been, had, had somebody pressed her on it. But there's that dead silence, isn't there? Nobody did. <laughs> that, that's very interesting because may, maybe the the fact that Walpole had so much information about China uh, turned him into an anti colonialists just like maybe Austin got information through her brothers like mm. who, who were in the navy I, I think to become critical of this empire I think you need to you need it you know actually to have some kind of information about how the local people were treated and things like that so I, I mean I was kind of making that kind of link while listening to your talk so that's yeah, good point very again. And again, we'd love to know, you know, we'd love to know what some of those conversations were, wouldn't we? Yeah, Between yeah. And her brothers. Yeah, exactly. The naval, the naval brothers, you know, who yes. had been far, of course, further afield than mm. she would ever, ever dream mm. of going. Yeah. yeah. So there is another very different uh, question from our audience. Did the letter inspire or influence Oliver Goldsmith, 1760, the citizen of the world? Could you? Yes, I mean, well, uh, Goldsmith is absolutely writing in the same tradition, this tradition of the foreign observer fiction. So it's it's not so much, I think, that, that Walpole influenced Goldsmith. It's more that both of them were writing right. in a tradition that goes back really to the late 17th century. Uh, and I'm actually a great uh, admirer of Goldsmith, uh, <laughs> and I think I think the Citizen of the World is is a wonderful piece. But then I think you know the same of of, of his novel, The Vicar of Wakefield, and his mm. his uh, his play and his you know his plays his play and his poems too. Uh, uh, I think a fascinating character as well, whom we should be you know we should we should be hearing more about. Thank you. What about Francis Burney? What did Francis Burney think of Walpole and mm. his writing? Or what's the relationship there? Well, thank you for asking, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, she did, I mean, what's, there are many interesting connections between Bernie and, and the Horace Walpole, one of which is that she did actually visit Strawberry Hill. Uh, she mm -hmm. was personally taken around. The Walpole had this wonderful system of having a housekeeper who would take you around unless you passed the sort of the Walpole test. You know, you had to be significant <laughs> enough to him to be led around in person, and he and she was, you know, so that's again a little uh, good for Horace, right? Uh, he, he took her around Strawberry Hill, uh, together with Queenie Thrale. That's really interesting too. Uh, Hester Thrale's daughter, Queenie, was part of that party. Uh, and long time, a long time later, uh, it, this is actually quite extraordinary. I mean, I, I think something like 20 or 30 years later, uh, Queenie Thrale and uh, Francis Burney were corresponding as, um, Long after Walpole's death, 
and Francis Bernie brings up that visit and says, do you remember when we went around Strawberry Hill together? You were just a, a child at the time and uh, wasn't it fascinating? So clearly she was, you know, she found Strawberry Hill uh, an amazing sight as it surely would have been, you know, stuffed with all of this. I, I mean, I have to emphasize that, just how chock-a-block Strawberry Hill would have been, like a real treasure house. It's, it's relatively small, but there's so many items that Walpole had collected over the years. So you can imagine the, the young Queenie and the somewhat older uh, Francis Bernie seeing this site for the first time, absolutely extraordinary. But the other important contact between Walpole and Bernie comes when she's at court. Uh, and as many of you all know, she was at court from 1786 to 91, becoming increasingly miserable. Um, working for Queen Charlotte as her um, keeper of the robe, so-called, uh, somewhat meaningless title because she had nothing to do with the robes, but was undergoing what was clearly a, a, you know, a, a, a mental and physical breakdown. And Walpole was absolutely aware of this uh, and, and did what he could to, 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 to help her. Um, th there was a lot of talk among uh, Birdie's, uh, the friends of, of Dr. Birdie, Francis' father, about what could be done. It's very difficult to extricate her because there, you couldn't just resign, you couldn't just leave the court. It was, you know, like the Hotel California. Um, uh, once you were there, you could, you, 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 were, you were certainly not supposed to leave. You could, you, you had to have a dramatically good reason. But one, of course, was to, was to marry. So Frances Burney was was certainly hoping to marry while she was at court, because that would have been her get out of jail card. But it didn't happen uh, for whatever, you know, for complicated reasons. There were suitors, but nothing worked. And so she was looked as though she could have been stuck at court for life. But Horace Walpole encouraged her to, you know, do so, you know, get out of there while you can. And ultimately, uh, a petition was drawn up, you know, uh, by, by several people to which he contributed and presented to the Queen. And, and Walpole was backing her all the way and saying, you know, you've got to do this. And unfortunately, Charles Burney here was somewhat of a force in the opposite direction. Uh, he was the one who badly wanted to get to court in the first place because he thought it would do such good for the Bernie family to have this well-placed daughter. And uh, although he could obviously see that his daughter was declining physically uh, over the years, he couldn't bring himself to you know, defy Her Majesty by, by asking for his daughter's release, which he should have done. And so Horace Walpole, I think, took a much you know, more admirable position here in, in, in telling her to, to get out while she could. So that's I think that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. It is. Interesting yeah. connection between them. They also, sort of, just while we're on the subject, they actually, there was even a servant connection. One of uh, Walpole's servants, uh, a Swiss called Colomb, uh, C O L O M B, uh, had a brother who was in the Bernie family employ. And there was a discussion about you know, the Cologne family between Bernie and Wall. I mean, these, you know, there's so many, of course, tiny connections among all of the people we study in the 18th century and Walpole and Bernie, absolutely, yeah. One of our participants had a, has an interesting question about um, the uh, parallels between narrative form and, and these uh, and Chinese taste. Um, so he's says he's wondering how the narrative form of Walpole and other British writers was informed by the spatial form of Chinese gardens. Um, I think he's referring primarily to Sharawaji and the, and the asymmetry. Um, he says, I remember reading Castle of Otranto and thinking that its narrative structure was like that of a twisting and winding garden. Mm. Yeah. Uh, do you well, have any? Do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, I think that's. I think that's a great observation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's it's nice to think, isn't it, that even though Walpole was recoiling from some of the uh, what was you know the vulgarization of of chinoiserie and and the Chinese taste, that it was still perhaps working in his unconsciousness. And I I, I think that's absolutely. I, I would agree with that. I think it's true of the uh, of the hieroglyphic tales themselves too, and yes, of the in other words, I think there is a connection between the Gothic and the Chinese. And, um, you know, just going back to my earlier point about placing the Chinese vase on that Gothic pedestal, I think that's Walpole himself admitting that one doesn't cancel out the other. So I don't know who made that observation, but I think, it, I think it's a really interesting one. Yes, the sort of Sharawaji uh, was something that was important to, to Walpole. And um, I think, you, you know, had, had Chinese... Had the Chinese taste not become so popular, I think Walpole would have probably remained keener on it than he was. But that slide I showed, you know, of the councilman's box, uh, this new built villa, this vulgarization of, 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 of a councilman, heaven help us, 
using Chinese motives. And I think at that point, you know, Walt Potter said, no, no, you know, this is not for me anymore, right? Um, so one of our audience wants to know about this particular vase or bowl in which Walpole's cat was drowned. And I, I was actually going to ask the same question. How big was this bowl? Uh, uh, well, well happily, I've seen it, so I can answer oh, that. You have. Oh, I have. Right. I, I not, not, <laughs> not, not, I, I, I hasten to say at the Earl of Derby is where it resides. He hasn't invited me to, for, a, for a personal showing. Um, oh, wow. Uh, no, he's not. He's not. He's not. He's not invited me. I mean, if he's watching, oh, okay. I, 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 I await the moment. No, I actually saw it at Strawberry Hill, uh, okay. where there was, a, there was a wonderful <laughs> exhibition at Strawberry Hill just a few years ago, put together by Strawberry Hill, um, which uh, borrowed the vase for the occasion, and oh. that was a magic moment. It was for me probably the most fascinating item there. But they did manage to bring. I mean, they got a few items. I think from Farmington uh, sent back from the United. You know, sent back from Farmington to Strawberry Hill <laughs> for that exhibition. But they got many from Europe, uh, uh, including I, 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 I recall. I think a, a wonderful suit of armor, if I'm not misremembering, uh, mm -hmm. but. Um, that Walpole had collected uh, because he liked to trace his ancestry back to the Middle Ages and the, uh, this, you know, suit of armor was supposedly something to do with the early Walpoles or whatever. But uh, <laughs> I do remember all kinds of interesting objects being shown uh, at this exhibition, which was only two or three years ago, at well, pre-COVID, uh, at Strawberry Hill. Uh, but the vase was, I think, the uh, perhaps the most delectable item there. It's quite big. I mean, it's, it obviously has to be big enough for a cat to drown it. That's the, the unpleasant answer, isn't it? Um, so it's, uh, what, maybe, uh, you can't really tell from the image I, I showed on the screen, but it's mm. probably a good uh, uh, two or three feet high. Um, wow. And, uh, and wide enough, you know, that the cat yeah. can, it, I think it held a solitary goldfish. I think it was just, this was a joke, you know, of, of, of the, the allusion to the, to the <laughs> lake, uh, right, which would be full of goldfish. But I think it had one solitary goldfish that the cat clearly was trying to get its paws and, you know, was trying to hook out of the, of the vase. Uh, yeah. And it, it, it does seem somewhat extraordinary to keep it, you know, for the rest of your life after what's happened. But I think it's also partly influenced by the Grey poem. I mean, Walpole mm. had this, you know, huge admiration for Grey as a poet, quite rightly so, I think, too. Uh, and the fact that, um, you know, Grey had commemorated the, both his cat and the vase in his way yeah. meant, I think, that the vase could never could never leave Strawberry Hill. And as I think I mentioned, he, he uh, inscribed two, two, two lines of the poem. Uh, on, mm. the, on the on the vase too. Yes, yes. I mean, from the slide, I I just could only imagine the size to be like a little cup. <laughs> well, yes, um, you're right. The slide is this. Uh, I, bl I blame the Earl of Derby for that for not giving us a good enough image. I, I, I do hope he's not 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 watching. I I might I might be excommunicated. Or... I thought Selena might have been a very uncoordinated cat or something. <laughs> <laughs> she probably was. Yes, I mean. <laughs> Maybe it was a particularly maybe it was a particularly juicy goldfish. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for answering. Actually, I have a question to expand on that. How would the goldfish have even gotten there? Were they imported or? Yes, I think they would have, they would have been imported. I mean, they would have been brought on ships. I mean, there was there was obviously plentiful trade between China and, and England, including all of these Chinese. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Chinese mm -hmm. items that Walpole collected. And I think the goldfish would have come on board a ship, yeah? Mm. Oh, that's a, that's a long way for a goldfish to travel. <laughs> right, well, it, would have, not... it, it would have been better staying on, on board ship, wouldn't it? <laughs> far, far from Salomon. <laughs> we do have a question. You talked a little bit about some of the books that Walpole read about China. Do you know um, perhaps any other avenues through which Walpole might have become interested in China, uh, perhaps culturally in England at that time, or what might have really sparked that initial interest? Mm. Uh, yeah, another great question. I mean, I, I think China, uh, China, uh, you know, in, in, in itself, the porcelain would have been enough to spark his interest. You know, the people who were making this, this these wonderful objects that he collected. Uh, he, you know, he, he loved French uh, porcelain as well. Uh, but he also had this great passion for, for, for Chinese porcelain. Mm -hmm. And I think that would have been one source of his interest. Uh, the initial spark, I think, did come from the Alda. Uh, as far as we know, he doesn't refer to anything to do with China until he starts reading that book. And then, of course, he starts reading other books, too. I think mm -hmm. that's probably how it, how it worked in his imagination, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, once again, drawing together multiple of your projects, um, how what do you happen to recall whether there are books on China in the Godmerson Library? Ah, yes. Well, that's a that's a that's a good question too. I mean, the first thing I looked at for the Godmerson, of course, was Horace Walpole. I um, mean, hoping that, for instance, the Castle of Otranto would have been there, or Walpole's works of 1798. Uh, that would have been a lovely Austin connection because the works contain both the hieroglyphic tales and a letter from Zoho. Tragically, it's not there. Uh, I almost felt like faking it and, you know, <laughs> pretending it was. <won't>, but <laughs> I decided I better not do that. Uh, so they do have several Walpole items. They do have some of his books on, 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 on painting uh, and I think a book on gardening, but they don't have his 1798 works. So no, no access for uh, to the cast of Otranto that way. But sorry, now I've lost the thread of your question. You, you, you asked about um, uh, what was, oh yes, anything on China in, um, in, uh, in I think, yeah. it, yes, I, I haven't actually checked that. I, I suspect there has to be something. I mean, I think a, a country house library at that time would have had something at least that they could have referred to, uh, but it's not, it's, not, it's not something I've actually tried to, to look for in the Reading with Austin website. But if you to do a search, I agree. I know they were very strong on, on works of reference of all kinds, uh, including atlases, uh, and um, you know China would have figured in some of some of the geographical works that they had for sure. Uh, factual works on on the ge geography of Asia would have been absolutely part of the the Godmersham Library, I think. Yes. There's um, a question about Walpole's book plate. Uh, this person wants to know whether he hand, hand wrote his name or was the, was it? Uh, uh, no, um, it was, it was printed. It was a printed book plate, but he had actually uh -huh. several versions of it. I mean, again, a good okay. question. And this was the earliest version. And then uh -huh. typically for I mean, a book, book collector, this is quite commonplace, as many of you all know, you gradually grow dissatisfied with your first yeah. book plate. And of course, <laughs> Once again, going back to the Godmersham, that's exactly what happened with the, with the Knight family. They had several different book plates, uh, some of them for the same knight, the same person who decided he wanted to, I mean, Montague Knight's the obvious example here, the late 19th century uh, uh, knight, who had, I think, three different versions of his own book plate, um, each one, you know, replacing the, 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 the previous one, presumably. And that was true with Horace Walpole, yes. Yeah. So he, 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 he would have, his printer would have uh, designed and, and printed the book plate. Uh, and um, presumably the printer would, or somebody at least some function, some functionally would have actually pasted it into the book. I can't see Walpole doing that himself. Um, and I would imagine the, uh, one of his uh, staff would have probably written in the shelf number as well, which you saw on that uh, on that slide too. Uh, but Walpole did like to put his own book plate in his books, and quite yes. wisely so, you know, given how hard it was to find books at the time and acquire books yeah. at the time. That's one way of making sure that your friends didn't walk off with them, right? <laughs> I, think a, I think he had three, uh, three, <laughs> three book plates. They're all quite similar, I mean, to that one. They all, for instance, use the word Horatio, not Horace. Um, oh. They've all got a similar design, um, mm -hmm. but some, you know, some slight changes are made to make it more palatable to him. I mean, after he, he was, he, he, he wasn't in fact, I mean, although he, uh, it, it, the, the book plate went into the, 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 the old volume, I don't think that uh, the volume, the, the book plate was created until, until later on, um, mm -hmm. until a good deal later on. As a young man, he didn't have a book plate. Uh, he was only 18 when he was reading to Al. I think the book plate was only created once he moved to Strawberry Hill and once mm. he was building up his library there, which would have been in the 1750s. You, you mentioned that his taste changed uh, mm. along the way. Did, did the, the taste for this book plate also changed as well? I mean, he, he was kind of wavering between like sort of Chinese taste and Gothic taste. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, another, another nice idea. It didn't, I mean, it would be nice if the book plate changed drastically, wouldn't it? It became Gothicized, <laughs> yeah. but that didn't actually happen. No, oh, he, never, okay. he never came out with a kind of Gothic-y looking book, book oh. book, right? Oh, with, that's you know, a shame. Glittering <laughs> candles and, uh, and lanterns <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, Although he did have a lantern at Strawberry Hill, he had a wonderful lantern, which is now oh. hanging in, in, in Farmington. So any of you visiting really? uh, the Lewis Walpole Library can see uh, uh, the, the, the very gothic lantern that was, you know, <laughs> uh, the gloop, that's the word he used, it's a wonderful word, gloop, gloomph. 
uh, the gloom cast <laughs> by the Gothic lantern, which of course are very small little window panels. Uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, so you can see, you can see the lantern. Yeah. yeah, thank you. We have one last question. It's, this is from the chat. It is a, a really interesting question. Um, one of our attendees mentioned that they visited Strawberry Hill in 2019 and learned among many other amazing things that guests of Walpole could view his cows painted blue in the field alongside the house, just for their amusement. Do you know why or what the origin of those blue cows might have been? I just missed a bit about, did you say blue, blue cows? <laughs> yep, that's what the comment says, that the visitors to Strawberry Hill could view his cows painted blue in the field <laughs> alongside his house. Now, blue cows, is, I, have, I have to say, is a new one to me. I mean, I, I've <laughs> often read Walpole talking about the vista, uh, and of course, this is where the ha-ha comes in, so now we've got another Austin connection, oh. I mean, thanks to, uh, thanks to Mansfield Park, right? Um, yeah. Walpole did have a ha-ha. Uh, and the reason for his ha ha was that he didn't own the land going down to the Thames. He owned uh, land, uh, a certain, his, his villa was a, a, above the Thames, of course, as it still is today. But the land from the Thames to the end of his land was owned by somebody else. But he considered that land part of his vista. And the mm -hmm. ha ha didn't interrupt the view as a, as a hedge or a fence would have done. So ha ha's are important for Walpole. And would have also the, kept uh, the cows in their proper place, but yes, yeah, that's true. He would have kept the cows in the proper place. But the business about painting the cows blue, no, I that, that, that I have to say is, is not something I've come across. Although I wouldn't put it past Walpole. It, it wouldn't. <laughs> Anything is possible with him. I see on the chat people are mentioning that they can see the scale of the uh, the, the vase in a way that I didn't manage to do. So mm -hmm. I'm, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Yeah, be sure to check out the links in the chat to see the, the vase. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. That was a fascinating talk and a fantastic Q&A. Learned lots of fascinating things about Horace Walpole tonight. So well, I, I really appreciate so the questions much. too. They've been, they've been you know, some, some great questions and comments from, from, from the organizers and from the audience. So I'm very much, very much appreciate that. And thank you again for inviting me too. And thank it's a great you, way to celebrate Austin's birthday. <laughs> well thank you to everyone in the audience we're going to wrap things up with a few uh bits of news from jane austen and company and the jane austen summer program so just hold on for a few more minutes uh coming up next with jane austen and company in january it's all about adaptations on January 13th, we're going to be talking about Pride and Prejudice in modern Japan. We're going to be, uh, Nori Yukihara is going to be looking at everything from films to manga adaptations to ask why Jane Austen continues to be so popular in Japan. And then on the 27th, Tristan Connolly, who is co-editing a book on um, Austen in Asia with Kimio, We'll be talking about the film Aisha, which is an adaptation of Emma. If you haven't seen it, it's a very fun Bollywood film that takes a lot of uh, its cues from Clueless. And you can watch it on Hulu or rent it from Amazon Prime in the United States. So why not make it a movie night? Watch Aisha, then come join Jane Austen and company for a great time. You can sign up for both of these events at our website, janeaustenandco.org. As always, registration is free. And be sure to follow our Facebook page for more news and updates about future events. Yes, and if you would like to read more about Jane Austen, her life, afterlives, and adaptations, come check out the blog for the Jane Austen Summer Program or follow us on social media. So JASP is a four-day summer symposium that typically takes place in June in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Next year's theme is Austin and Shakespeare, and it will take place from June 16th through 19th, 2022. So join us there for lectures, hands-on workshops, small discussion groups, exhibits, and other activities that blend scholarship with fandom. Registration will open in the next few weeks and JASP always sells out. So please keep an eye on our website, janeaustinsummer.org. 
and uh, we've decided now. I think the registration will open the, in uh, in early January. Is the current plan. This program um, was partially funded by the North Carolina Humanities Council, uh, which is an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we would like to thank the UNC, UNC North, University of North Carolina's Humanities for the Public Good Program, um, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, as well as the Carolina Asian Center for uh, some support of our program as well. In honor of Jane Austen's birthday, why not consider making a gift to the Jane Austen Summer Program? Um, <laughs> We're a registered nonprofit, so in the US, your donations are tax deductible. Um, and they help us keep these events free, uh, open to the public, and to help us bring in great speakers like Peter. Um, they also go to supporting our other activities, like our student essay contests, and helping us keep uh, scholarships available for teachers who want to attend um, the Jane Austen Summer Program for free. Thank you so much, Peter, and, and thank you all for attending. I saw people from Scotland and Canada and uh, many places around Japan and many other places around the world. Um, so we really appreciate your being part of this community. Hope you stay healthy and safe until we meet again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Bye bye. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, lovely to see you, Camille, too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye.